Hi everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Margaret Ellis Raymond and I'm an author and I was born with tricuspid atresia. This series of videos is to thank all mothers of CHD children. The human side of congenital heart conditions is often buried by the medical. I hope this series of videos brings comfort and answers. If you enjoy, please subscribe as that helps me reach more people who might benefit from this content. Happy Mother's Day. Hello, thank you so much for joining me, Lacey. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> so what was your reaction to finding out that your daughter has um, a heart condition? So it was about, it was probably, I want to say like seven hours after she was born um, when we found out and the resident that was on call had come in and she was explaining what they had found on an ultrasound for her. I remember just kind of going, oh, <laughs> and I think half of it was because I was just tired and the other half of it was you don't expect something like that. You don't expect somebody to say, um, your daughter has a uh, congenital or a few congenital heart defects. You kind of just, I didn't even know what it was. I had never heard of um, CHD until my daughter was born. And I remember my husband too, specifically remember the resident doctor being like, wow, you know, you're taking this really well because we weren't, I wasn't crying. I didn't burst, you know, I didn't burst into tears. I wasn't like, what are you talking about? Or anything like that. I was just kind of like, okay <laughs> um almost like it didn't really sink in you, you don't expect that um you know she's my se she's my second daughter i have a five-year-old named quinn um she's completely heart healthy as far as, as much as we know as far as we know um so i just kind of assumed it would be the same thing um right. with indiana and yeah i was i would say stunned would be the best way to describe that <laughs> So you mentioned that the that they did an ultrasound. Was that after she was born or while she was before she was born? A lot of parents tend to find out um, if their child has, you know, especially a congenital heart defect at the gender scan. You know, it's about the 20, 22 week mark. Yeah. Well, we had something kind of different um, during that scan. They had found a. Um, enlargement of her aorta okay. and a bright spot so they wanted us to go where we live in massachusetts they wanted us to go to um boston children's um to have a more like detailed scan um with a pediatric cardiologist so about a few weeks later we went and i remember it being in january and it was about about an hour and a half um and a lot of the time she was moving around quite a bit um in utero and at the end of the scan, you know, we waited for the results and they said, uh, the cardi pediatric cardi cardiologist came in and said, um, they don't find any genetic markers of anything. There was no congenital heart defects. There was nothing with Down syndrome. There was, everything looked, you know, fine. She, I remember it's clear as day. She described it as a genetic tra uh, genetic trait that she's going to grow into, like having freckles or something like that. Um, there was no need for a follow-up, you know, everything would be fine. Um, and my husband and I left, and we were kind of like, okay, this is good, but, you know, we still don't understand how you can just grow into something like that, how you can... You know, how is that a mild thing? How do you know there's not going to be something down the road? So my husband reminded me of this and he said, maybe we could have like an ultrasound um, after she's born, just, just to be sure. When the resident PD, uh, pediatrician came in to do her first check on Indiana, and I remember changing her diaper while this is happening, I asked if we could have, um, you know, an echo just to see you know, just to make sure everything was okay. You know, did it get bigger? Did it stay the same? Did it go away? You know, what exactly was it? And that's when we found out later on, after they had that echo, they found the congenital heart defects and we went. And that was probably the other reason why we were so stunned because we had just been told, you know, a few months before that, no, it's just something she's gonna grow into. And we're like, that's not something <laughs> we can grow into. <laughs> uh, what is her, what is her uh, CHD? So she has a, a large conoventricular VSD, 
uh, ventricular septal defect. It's a mouthful, and it was a mouthful to us. Um, you know, she's a year old now, so now we can just say those things and not fumble over right. it or anything. We're so used to it now. Um, so she has that. Uh, it was about seven and a half uh, millimeters large. It was a big one. She had mild, uh, mild pulmonary uh, valve stenosis which is the narrowing and then later when she had open heart surgery they found a pfo as well um, so she had a couple things going on so how did you upon hearing this and and you know you kind of had the idea that maybe something might be wrong so you had it double checked um what was your kind of coping mechanism with having that now be a reality well i'm the type of person where if I, it's, it sounds strange, but I work best in chaos. Um, I keep busy um, yeah. with things like that. So uh, my first thing was I need to learn everything possible uh, about congenital heart defects. That's my first thing, you know, this is my, this is my, it's my daughter's fight, but it's also my fight because I want to know as much, you know, as the cardiologist knows <laughs> if I can. Um, so I did a lot of research and I actually, um, the first thing I did was look up some organizations um, to learn about it. And there's actually not a lot um, considering that it's, you know, the most common birth defect, there's, you know, when you Google it, you find maybe four organizations and then there's like the, you know, the sort of smaller ones afterwards, but there's really, you know, you don't hear about them. You don't see them on TV, um, like you would like St. Jude's Hospital and, you know, and right. that kind of thing. So the first website I clicked on happened to be the Children's Heart Foundation. And they offer a book, informative book about congenital heart defects. I have it still. Um, and it's called It's My Heart. And it has everything from all the different types of uh, known congenital heart defects to describing uh, the procedures, whether they're, you know, during open heart surgery or catheterizations. They, you know, break down all the type of devices, you know, what a catheter is or, you know, like, um, or talking about procedures like the Norwood, the Glenn, the Fanta, you know, those kind of things. And it's really helpful, especially for families that are just starting out. Um, you know, anytime I meet a new family online, um, this is one of the first things I say is, you know, start here. Um, you know, it's easy to understand. It's written by all doctors, uh, people in medicine. Um, it's really a great book. And so I read this like front to back. <laughs> um, yeah. So did the rest of my family. Um, they wanted to do that too. So for you, it was knowledge and gaining that understanding in this new world yeah. you had been opened up to. Yes, I became a CHD advocate overnight. <laughs> that was a, that was a, okay, so I, you know, I'm ready to learn and I'm ready to help, you know, and, you know, all I can think about is all the other parents that have to learn about this, you know, um, and it's just, it's a lot. There's a lot of information. Um, it can be very overwhelming. Um, I don't think I really felt like really powerful emotions until actually after her surgery. I think because I, I think that's when everything caught up. Um, right. And it just, that's, that's when the, all of that hit me. But I was too distracted with work and learning, t um, you know, to cope with those, with those feelings. So uh, once it did hit you, af so you said it hit you after she had finished surgery or after they had finished surgery. Yeah. How, now it's hit you. How did you cope with those emotions? What did you, what were some strategies? I'm trying to remember. This was, I mean, this was like a few months. So it happened a few months after her open heart surgery and we were on a trip in Maine, um, and this was after, you know, she could actually sit in a car seat and everything. This was, you know, you have to wait a little while after. She, we were sitting at the, at the beach, um, and she was in a little car seat, and I just started sobbing. Um, and it was just her, it was her and I, um, my husband and my daughter were somewhere else, and I just started sobbing because, you know, I realized just how lucky we were to have her with us um 
you know, the surgery gave, you know, gave her back to us, so to speak, you know, or, you know, or she was up in the air for so long. Um, and, you know, the surgeries, you know, gave her, a, you know, a chance to have her and, you know, grow up with her sister. So to cope with that, I just kept working. I did, um, I got involved um, with some organizations. Um, I made up my own, not, I don't really call it an organization. I call it like a, like a resource website. Um, I'm not particularly sure what else I'm going to be doing with it. You know, I kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, that's called, um, CHD and me, um, which it's not just CHD and me. That's actually one of the other ways I coped was it was originally CHD and me was like, it was CHD and me, like, what do I do with it? You know, what do I, and then after a while, you know, and getting to know people in the community and being taken in f with all these families, these seasoned, um, heart families for so long, you know, it kind of became like CHD and just all of us. Right. Um, and so to cope, I would find resources that I thought would help, you know, new parents, especially help support the families, um, you know, and sharing, um, um, stories, um, that families have written about their children or that adult warriors have written about themselves, um, to try and show like, you know, that we're not by ourselves. It's a very lonely feeling as a heart parent. It's okay to feel that way. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be frustrated, angry, upset, all those things. I'm just a very stubborn person. <laughs> and I tend to take those emotions and put it into something else, helping other people. Like, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm gonna help other people. I'll get to me later. Yeah. Um, so that was, that's basically, I just kept working worked harder <laughs> if anything <laughs> what what was delivery like so it was actually totally different uh from my first my firstborn the two labors and deliveries um were totally different my firstborn um, was an emergency uh, cesarean it was focused on this next one indiana's being a v-back a vaginal birth after cesarean i had a midwife they they gave me the go that we could go for it so i got to experience all the things that i didn't experience with my firstborn um you know my water breaking um laboring in tubs just going through the motions of what you know natural labor would look like um eventually i did have to some medicine in me to kind of temp, uh, temper the pain a little bit because I had very um, tough um, contractions and I had back labor and I remember saying to my husband I was probably about s more than halfway and I remember saying to my husband like I'm gonna black out <laughs> I'm in I was in that much pain I'm gonna black out um, so they gave me the medicine and then um, I she was a success successful VBAC she looked great uh, she wasn't uh, blue. Um, she had an APGAR score of a nine. I mean, and she, they said everything looked great. Um, there was no evidence of like a heart murmur or anything. Uh, yeah, it just kind of, you know, it. So were you at home? Was this a home birth? No, this was in the hospital. This was a different hospital too. Okay. Um, yes. Um, so then in the hospital, you said, Hey, I want you to take a look at yes. her heart. And so yes. they were able to do that. Okay. Okay, gotcha. I gotcha. Um, because it's on the same floor, um, as oh. we, as we were on, so that was um really helpful. We we actually sat there and watched it, um, happen. There's like this big window, and you can sit out. And she was so good. She just laid there and stared up at the screen. She didn't squawk or move once. It was amazing. And so then they find the diagnosis, and then you, you have she has the surgeries, or was it one or two? Just one, one surgery. Thankfully. Okay. How did you um, prepare for that surgery? Did you have time? Was there time in between after the, the ultrasound when they found it and then the surgery? Yes, we had time. Um, so her cardiologist's name is Dr. Benavidez and he is our best friend. <laughs> um, absolutely amazing. Um, he said that he wanted her surgery. She, he said it. That was one of the first things that he told us was she's going to have to have open heart surgery. There are some VSDs that can close on their own, but because that hers was particularly large, he's like, they we're going to have to have um, closer surgery. Right. So um, he wanted her surgery to be at six months. Okay. Um, which was October of last year. 
However, when she was three months, a little before three months old, this was in June, um, she was three months in July, um, she wasn't gaining enough weight, um, she was struggling to breathe, she was struggling to eat, so they deemed her failure to thrive, and she was also um, going into congestive heart failure as well, because the left side of her heart was starting to um, enlarge. So they decided that she needed to have the surgery uh, much earlier, and so it was about a few weeks later in July. So she was born in April, and she had her open heart surgery in July, uh, July 22nd. Yeah, she wasn't supposed to have it till at least six months, but we had to bump it up to three because she just wasn't doing well. As far as we know, first and only surgery. Um, the last echo she had, and she's going to be going in the summer um, because you have to keep checking, you know, for basically the rest of her life. Um, they said that the um, VSD looks good. They said that her aorta was mildly borderline dilated her aorta so they're gonna look into that um, which the only time I ever heard her aorta enlarged was when you know she was in utero so now hearing it again is kind of like oh gosh you know you, you you think that you're out of the you know you're out of the woods uh, but then there's always it's and that's what happens there's gonna there may end up be something um, you know down the road they're just gonna keep an eye on it and we're gonna check it out in the summer but we heard we heard that and we went oh <laughs> yeah yeah it's a lifelong um just checkups yeah yep yep yeah. yep doctor's appointments diagnostic testing um you know there's the possibility of hospitalization she actually was hospitalized in december for something totally different um yeah. but it doesn't help when you have congenital heart defects, you're more um, you're more able to get what would be a common cold. What um, what she had was RSV and bronchiolitis. Um, she had a really bad version of it, and so what could be like the common cold, you know, to a heart healthy kid can send a baby, you know, into the which is what happened in Deanna. Especially if you have two different flu like things happening yeah. at the same time, it's not a good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Our oldest had it for a day. And I mean, we know that's where she got it from. She went to school and brought it back. And um, But then Indiana had it and she ended up uh, in the PICU for 10 days. So what was that like? That must have been kind of a similar shock to the surgery, right? I, I actually had a harder time with that than I did the open heart surgery because I was I prepared myself for her open heart surgery. I mean, I, you know, I talked to other parents, you know, what do I bring? What do I do? I knew, I knew everything about this. Now there's this new thing I'd never right. even heard of. She was on a ventilator um, for uh, nine, eight, or eight, eight out of 10 of those days, uh, which is tough. You know, with her open heart surgery, she got off the ventilator that night. She had it in the, um, an open heart surgery, she, um, their surgery started at seven and she was off the ventilator that night. So we only saw it for, a, you know, one day where this one, she was on it for eight days. The outcome is almost unknown. Whereas with the surgery, you're like, okay, this is to help yeah. her. Whereas yes. this was, uh, it's completely out of our hands. <laughs> yeah. So it's harder. Yeah, you have to, I mean, you're constantly, with both things, you're constantly watching her vitals. They have the vitals up on the screen, um, you know, and they would be changing the settings all the time in the ventilator. Sometimes she'd need more oxygen, and then during the day she'd have less oxygen, and then when night would come, she'd need it again. Um, she had a few cases of apnea, which for some people, if they don't know, that's when you stop breathing in your sleep. They said that's common uh, with RSV, um, and it's very scary when your eight month old <laughs> is doing that. You know, she, we were actually had changed hospitals. We were originally at a Newton Wellesley hospital, and we were there for one night, and she was in, a, she was in respiratory distress. Uh, her f coloring um, around her mouth was dusty. Um, she just looked sick. She lost all the color in her face. I mean, it was, it was scary. People were, you know, in and out of the room. You know, they said, we're going to have to put her on a ventilator, you know, through here versus here. Um, and we elected to go to Mass General because we know the hospital. That's where she had open heart surgery. And we know the PICU. We know the nurses there, the doctors there. And I just felt more comfortable. I felt like they were more 
um, equipped. Not, not to say that Newton Wellesley not, but they have more, they don't have a pick you at Newton Wellesley okay. like they do at Mass General. Okay. Um, so, and they were seeing cases and cases of it. So that was pretty tough, you know, not knowing, you know, when she was going to get off the ventilator. And how is she now? She's doing really well. Um, she's taking a nap now, <laughs> um, but she's really thriving. Um, it's so different um, because before surgery, um, you could tell she, you can't, all right, so you can't, it's almost like, see, she is almost like an invisible illness, but the difference between, like, the photos of her post, you know, uh, before surgery and a few months after surgery, she looks much, much healthier now than she did then. Like, before, you know, she was always pale, she was breathing from the stomach, I mean, you could tell that she was struggling, she was, you know, tiny, and now she is, like, all pink, her fingers and toes and everything are pink, um, when they weren't that color before, um, for the first three months and she's eating, she's not struggling. She'll actually take a bottle. I mean, it's so nice. Yeah. Um, is there any, is there any recommendation that you have for mothers who are going into surgery, um, with their young ones? What should they bring? Um, I, so I would bring, you know, your, your, your phone and your chargers, always remember your chargers. It can get really dry in there, so I would bring some chapstick, I'd bring some lotions for your hands, um, I'd bring some things to keep you busy. Um, you know, whether you knit or you crochet or just coloring, um, bring some music, like your iPod, um, bring some snacks. You know, I mean, you can you can get food there and you can get, but it's nice to have your own snacks there. The big thing that I did was for Indian in particular. And some hospitals may not allow this, but Mass General did um, in the PICU. I took all of, in, not all of them, but quite a bit of Indiana's toys and blankets. And I decorated the room. Because when, you know, even if the babies don't notice it, it just kind of brings warmth and comfort into the room too. So I had like her blankets all over the place. I had like stuffed animals hanging off of, you know, IV things that they weren't using. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, you know, anything that didn't get in the way. And they loved it. They were like, yeah. this is great. Um, you know, yeah. bring some color into the room. I think it really does make a difference. For the mother and the family and the child, yeah. Because you're bringing, you know, home with you. You know, you're going to be there for at least a week. Um, we were there for five days. And it's just nice having something familiar um, because the inside of a hospital room, it's just white, you know, barren. There's nothing really there. It's cold. It's not very homey. Um, so that would be a big thing. Um, definitely bring some stuff that makes it more like home. Um, for you, your family, and your child especially. Do you have any advice for mothers who are just finding out that they're going to have an infant uh, with a congenital heart defect or mothers who find out after they give birth? What is like one big piece of advice that you would want to share with them? Speak up. I, you are the voice of your child and if you have this this gut feeling like we did we're a perfect example we were given the green light when they we had a minor scare um you know during pregnancy and we we still had that feeling that there was something wrong speak up you 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 are the voice you have to advocate for your child you know your child best yeah. so don't be afraid um because more than likely that gut feeling is right and then, is there any organizations that you would recommend uh, or that would help mothers uh, to, to research? So definitely the Children's Heart Foundation. That's the first organization that I got into. And that's also, again, where the book was. <laughs> um, so that's, and that says, It's My Heart. You'll find that in the, you can even, you can find it on Amazon. Um, and that's a really helpful book. Uh, like I said, there's there's not many CHD books out there, um, but that is definitely one to have um, in your repertoire. And another one is called Conquering CHD. 
It was originally the Pediatric and General Heart Association, um, but because they cover the entire lifespan from, because CHD is forever, um, it doesn't stop, you know, with any types of medical intervention. It's, it's forever. It doesn't, you know. Um, they cover the entire lifespan from, you know, baby to um, adult. Um, they do a little bit of everything. The Children's Heart Foundation, um, focuses solely on funding research, on CHC research, but they do have events. They have an annual walk in all different types of states um, that you can raise money for, and it's fun to all get together and meet other um, families there. They cover with research, um, data transparency, they support families, they um, give hope, they empower, they advocate in D.C. to try and, like, you know, um, help with, like, lawmakers and to changing laws f um, to help and benefit um, CHD families. They also offer, um, at Conquering C CHD, they also offer um, hospital bags um, and prenatal kits and adult teen kits um, with resources and information to help you, not only with the information, but things that you may need um, when you're in the hospital, you know, and your child's in the hospital that could help. Um, I'm actually very deeply involved with it because I'm starting a Massachusetts chapter. <laughs> Whoa, so could you tell us what that chapter is called if people want to get involved in your area? Well, it's not ready yet. <laughs> We're so close. We're in the final steps of launching. Um, okay. So it's going to be Conquering CHD Massachusetts. It's the whole, it's going to be the whole state. Um, and we're going to be working with hospitals um, all around in the area. Um, we'll be doing like support groups, um, events. You know, we um, like the idea of having things where families can get together, you know, ideas like um, having, um, new heart families um, getting together with like more seasoned ones so they can you know um, help out each other um, there's going to be a lot <laughs> so that should be maybe like late summer early fall i'm thinking um, of 2021 so, or 2020 2020 yeah 2020. Okay. A, little, a little closer cool. fall 2020. awesome um, so if everyone's watching this in a later date it should be all ready and the link should be, be in go. the description yeah, of the video we're, we're, we're all very excited i can't wait to start this um like i said we're in the final final steps to launching so we'll be we'll be out soon um, right. well thank you so much lacy for joining me and sharing your story and definitely anybody who's interested check out the information in the description i'm going to link everything that lacy um provided us today and thank you so much for joining me for having me margaret i was excited to be here excited to help this was really fun i really loved this <laughs> awesome all righty well we'll talk to you soon hopefully <laughs> all right it sounds great thank all you so right. much thank you bye, bye.